Uh, good. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So this is our recent work called Cluster DE, which we hope to propose as a general statistical framework to counteract double dipping, which is prominent in both single cell and spatial omics data analysis. So to begin with, differential expression analysis is one of the most widely performed statistical analysis in genomic data analysis. Specifically, for bulk RNA-seq data, the most common analysis is that we have two conditions. Under each condition, we have several replicate RNA-seq samples. So for example, condition one could be the untreated control condition. Condition two could be the treated or disease condition. So for each gene, we want to perform one hypothesis test to examine whether the gene should have the same true expression level under the two conditions. So we do one test per gene. If we reject the null hypothesis for that gene, we call the gene a DE gene, differential express gene. This is called a multiple testing problem because the number of genes are in the tens of thousands per human. And also we want to look at all the genes p-values jointly to make a p-value threshold and to call DE genes. So in this case here, I want to emphasize that the two conditions are predefined. We know which RNA seq sample is under which condition. So to set the p-value threshold when we have so many hypothesis tests, this problem is called multiple testing. So we know that we cannot simply set a p-value threshold as 0.05. The reason is if we do more tests, then we expect mm. to have more false positives. Mm -hmm. So multiple testing correction was proposed to counteract this thing, this inflation as the test statistic goes up. And the most widely used criterion for multiple testing correction is called false discovery, as short as FDR. And here I'm introducing the definition under the frequentist statistical mm -hmm. framework, mm -hmm. which was proposed by this phenomenal paper in 1995 by Benjamin and Hochberg. Specifically, FDR is defined as the expectation of a ratio. Mm -hmm. And the ratio is that given your threshold on p-values, the denominator is the number of discoveries, the number of DE genes you call. The numerator is the number of false discoveries among your discoveries. Yes. Please note that this ratio is not observable itself because we don't know the ground truth. We don't know how many discoveries are false. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, even though we don't observe this ratio, but we can control the expectation of this ratio. Nice. So the reason I call it frequent test FDR is that we have the expectation taken over all possible samples mm -hmm. from the same population as our sample. So our sample is just one of the many. Oh. And the expectation is taken over the distribution. And we can say that if oh, Jessica, that, uh, I have a yes. quick question. Sure. FDR yeah. notation, what is the meaning of this um, oh, uh, BN1? Yeah. yeah, this means that uh, this means the maximum of the two. It's just the maximum. Ah. So we want to avoid the dividing zero thing. Oh, I see. Wow, yeah, I never seen yeah. this notation before. That's very cool. Yeah, okay. yeah it's <laughs> sometimes using statistics. Oh, I see. Very good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the question. Uh -huh. So the FDR control will rely on p-values, and the p-values are ordered. So basically, I'm introducing the benjamin hopper procedure for controlling FDR given p-values. Suppose that we have m genes. Here we call them m features. Each gene has a p-value from the DE test. We order the p-values from the smallest to the largest. We sort them, and we have a target FDR q in mind. This is typically 5%. Then how do we set the p-value threshold? The benjamin Hopper procedure is actually very simple. We compare each ordered p-value from the smallest, and we compare, say, the j's smallest p-value to this varying threshold. The threshold is q times j divided by m. So you can see that the threshold increases as J increases. Okay. So for each P-value, we compare to the threshold. 
and we keep on going unless this inequality breaks. Mm -hmm. So we just want to keep all the p-values mm -hmm. that are consecutively under this varying threshold. So once it breaks, we go back to the last k such mm -hmm. that for j going from one to k, mm -hmm. this inequality holds. Mm -hmm. And these are our discoveries. So basically, Benjamin Hochberg relies on p-values for setting the threshold and call the e-genes. Mm -hmm. And later, uh, there is a star risk q-value procedure, which is a modification for this procedure to hopefully gain better power. But I have to say empirically, for most cases, the two procedures give similar results. Mm -hmm. One thing I have to note here is that Oops, I think there was mm -hmm. stuck, sorry. One mm -hmm. thing I have to note here is that to make this procedure work, the p-values should satisfy one assumption, one condition. The condition is that for the genes that are truly, no, truly non-DE genes, so they shouldn't be DE genes, their p-values should be uniform between zero and one. Mm -hmm. You should follow uniform distribution and they should be independent. So these are the assumptions required for this FDR control. Okay, so this is why I said they require high, valid p-values uniform between zero and one mm -hmm. under the null hypothesis. And also the p-values should better have a high resolution. By high resolution, I mean that if the p-value is small, close to zero, mm -hmm. we'd, we'd better have many, many digits so that we can better distinguish the p-values and comparing them to the threshold. Otherwise, if the p-values are very coarse, like we only have p-values say 0.01, then 0.2, if we have very coarse resolution, then to satisfy this inequality, we may have very few rejections. Then even though we can control the FDR, but we don't have a good power. Power means that when the gene is a true DE gene, can we discover it? Can we reject it? Mm -hmm. So therefore, given the FDR, we hope to have better power. So I want to use this opportunity to briefly mention that this paper was mm -hmm. what we published in 2022. Mm -hmm. It's not a method paper, but it's an analysis paper where we found by accident that if we use popular differential expression method, mm -hmm. including dec 2 hr on human population rna seq samples, which are not experimental replicates, but rna seq from human individuals, then we may have exaggerated false positives mm -hmm. indicating that the FDR is not actually controlled. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this happens is that in, this, in these methods, they have an inherent negative binomial assumption for every gene's RNA counts in the samples of one condition. Mm -hmm. And this condition is reasonable for experimental replicates, mm -hmm. but it may be violated violated if under one condition you have human individuals whose diversity, whose heterogeneity is much bigger than experimental replicates. So that's the major reason. The violation of the negative binomial assumption would violate the validity of p-values mm -hmm. and therefore lead to false discoveries. Mm -hmm. So I want to raise this attention that p-value validity is very, very important. So now I will move on to single cell data analysis. I want to say that in this typical pipeline, there is an interesting difference between single cell and the bulk RNA-seq. So I'm talking about one single cell RNA-seq sample in which we measure the cells. We process the data to a gene by cell count matrix. So the count indicates the gene expression level in the cell. And the task we talk here, talk about here is the cell type annotation task. What we want to do is to annotate cell types from the data. Because when we do the experiment, we measure all cells in the sample, say in our blood, but we don't have the cell type labels for the cells. So we don't know which cell is which. Mm -hmm. So then the first important analysis we must do is to divide cells into clusters based on this matrix. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully each cluster is one cell type. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But how do we know the cell type? We would do differential expression analysis. Mm -hmm. So we can hopefully find the highly expressed genes in each cluster mm -hmm. and then compare these genes to our knowledge mm -hmm. then to give the cell cluster a type. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Okay. So this is called post-clustering DE analysis. The interesting difference between this DE analysis and the previous one I introduced is that here the clusters are not predefined. Mm -hmm. Unlike the bulk pharmacy, we have patients under normal condition, under disease condition. Here the clusters are defined based on the data. And this is the problem we call double dipping. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we cut double dipping here. Okay. So basically, it means that same data is used twice. Oh. First, for clustering. We define cell clusters based on that matrix. Second, we use that matrix again to define differential express genes between the clusters. Hmm. So this is a toy example to show what we mean by false discovery. So this toy example is simulation. What we do is that we generated cells from a mm -hmm. bivariate Gaussian distribution, mm -hmm. meaning that the cells are from just one homogeneous population. And there's just one cell type, if we believe. Mm -hmm. Then we show the two genes. If we run a clustering algorithm, say k-means, to divide the cells into two clusters, then naturally both genes will become differential express genes. Mm -hmm. The reason is that their variance drive the clustering result. So they are the drivers behind the clusters. Therefore, no wonder they both become DE genes. But, but this result cannot tell us, oh, these two genes are marker genes of the two clusters, and therefore the two clusters are cell types. So we cannot go there. So therefore, what we mean is that you would have this false positive cell type marker genes due to double dipping. And the, in, the essence behind double dipping is confirmation bias. Because we derive the clusters from the data, then we use the same data to confirm the clusters. Then no wonder we will have this false positive inflation. Oh, I see. Yeah, so in the following, I will use mathematical notations to facilitate my discussion. So here I would write the matrix as a cell by gene matrix because in the statistical convention, we wow. consider cells to be samples from a distribution and we consider genes to be variables or features. So we consider N cells and we use I to denote cell I and we consider M genes using J to denote gene. So in this notation, we would have yi as the vector for cell i. So cell i would be represented as an n-dimensional vector for the m genes. And also, putting all cells together, we have a collection of cells. Mm -hmm. And we need this math cal notation because we want to say that when we do clustering, mm -hmm. let me just go one more step, when we do clustering, a clustering algorithm, for example, k-means, is applied to this set of cells mm -hmm. so that after the clustering algorithm, we would map every cell I to a label. Mm -hmm. Here, for simplicity, I'm talking about two cell types. So the zi indicates the true cell type, but we don't observe it. So we call it a latent cell type. Mm -hmm. And zi hat means the cluster label. So mm -hmm. it's not, it may or may not be the true cell type. So it's cell cluster. Then what we really want to find using the DE analysis is to identify true cell type marker genes. So for the following, because I will focus on one gene and also I will focus on the null hypothesis, which is based on the whole cell population instead of one cell. So that's why I will for now drop the cell index I, just use YJ for gene J, Z for the cell type, just to gen represent a general cell. So for this, if I'm interested in gene J, whether it's a true cell type marker gene, the ideal null hypothesis I should have is to compare gene J's 
conditional expectation under cell type zero and under cell type one. I want to compare these two means. Mm -hmm. And the ideal null hypothesis should be that these two means are equal to each other. And if it holds, we call this gene J a true non-DE gene. That should be the ideal null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But since we don't observe Z, that's yes. the problem. Yes. What if we use the Z hat from the clusters, mm -hmm. from the clustering algorithm? Mm -hmm. Then we are actually testing a different null hypothesis mm -hmm. and we call this double dipping DD null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. That is the con in the condition we have Z hat instead of Z. And from a statistical point of view, this null hypothesis is not is actually not well defined uh -huh. because we know that mathematically the two condition expectations would depend on z hat. And z hat is a random variable depending on my data. Mm -hmm. So we're comparing two random variables instead mm -hmm. of a population property. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in this double dipping null hypothesis, it's possible that this one does not hold, but the ideal null hypothesis holds. So even though we haven't done any statistical tests or mm -hmm. we don't use any data yet, even mm -hmm. at the conceptual level, we could have false discovery. Yes. So this modified null hypothesis does not hold, but this holds, then we have a false positive DEG. Mm -hmm. And this is the cartoon illustration showing what I mean. And this naive method I call double dipping, Basically, we first use clustering to divide our cells into two halves, two groups. And I call the first group training data. And I apply, uh, sorry, my bad. Sorry, I hear I just divide the two halves. Then I directly apply a DE test to each gene to compare the two groups. Treating the two clusters as two conditions, I get a p-value for each gene. Mm -hmm. And then I would set a p-value threshold by the benjamin Hopper procedure, mm -hmm. and we call DE genes. Mm -hmm. But then you can see that, I think this, sorry, I think my computer is a little bit lagging today. You can see that here, gene mm -hmm. one is a true non-DE gene, but as a result of double dipping, if I compare the gene one's distributions under the two clusters, mm -hmm. we see a big difference and we have a significant p-value. So it shows that the gene will be called DE gene. Mm -hmm. And realizing this issue in the literature, there are several methods that try to counteract double dipping or in particular two major methods. Mm -hmm. So one idea is to use what we call cell split or motivated by the cross validation idea. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that how about we do a random split of cells mm -hmm. first, use one half to do clustering to define cell clusters, use the second half to call the genes. But one thing to note here is that for the second half, the cells do not have, have cluster labels themselves. Therefore, we must find a way to transfer the first half cell type, cell cluster labels to the second half. Mm -hmm. Then this label transfer is typically done by classification. So we can train a binary classifier here, apply to the second half, then the second half cells will have labels. But as you can imagine, on the second half, you essentially have double dipping. Because when you predict the cell type labels, cell cluster labels, using the classifier, you use the data once, and then you use the data for the second time to do the DE test. So, because of this second half still have double dipping, we can see that as a result for this gene one as a true non-DE gene, we still have that on the second half we call test data, this gene one has this difference and this is to do double dipping. So for training data, no wonder gene one will have different distribution due to double dipping, but because of label transfer on mm -hmm. the second half, it still has double dipping. Uh. <laughs> that yeah. means I solve so, it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so cell split doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. How about gene split? Mm -hmm. Gene split mm -hmm. means that when I want to test gene one, I leave it out. I only use the remaining genes to do clustering. Then, given the clusters, 
I test for gene one. Oh. So this one will not use gene one in the clustering. Mm -hmm. It seems that we avoid the double dipping. But on a practical note, you will see that this is not feasible because this means that to test each gene, you need to do one clustering. Mm -hmm. So you need to do how many PM rounds of clustering if you have M genes, that would be too much. Mm -hmm. But besides that, we also found that gene split will have a problem when we have gene-gene correlations, which mm -hmm. we'll show later. And recently, there is an interesting method called CAM split which proposed this very, I would say, innovative idea to split original matrix into two matrices of the same dimensions, same numbers of cells, same numbers of genes. And what we do is that for each count, the RNA seq singles so RNA seq data has counts, right? So we split each count into two counts, like three becomes one and two, three becomes zero and three, zero becomes zero and zero. Oh, so randomly split? Very good question. Mm -hmm. What it does is to do binomial sampling. Oh, with okay. Let's do one half. Yeah, you take okay. three as a total. You draw okay. binomial sample. I see. Yeah. yeah, so when you do this split, you have the same cells, right? So you use the first matrix to do clustering, and naturally the cluster labels will be applied to the second half because the same cells. Mm -hmm. Then you use the second half to do the DE test. So you don't use the same count matrix for both. Mm. Seems to be a very nice idea, but mm. then I will show you that gene-gene correlations will also be problematic. So this is a summary of what I just said. Count split is the mm. recent method that uses binomial sampling. Mm. And the paper has the theory showing that when YIJ, the count here, if it follows a Poisson distribution, then we can show that the two split counts, YIJ1 and YIJ2, are both Poisson independent. So independence can be proven. And the two split counts Poisson parameter, mean parameter, will just be one half of the original Poisson mean. And later, the authors extended this idea and called this the, uh, data thinning. And cell split, I introduce. Gene split, I introduce. And this earlier method, TN test published in 2019, mm -hmm. implemented the cell split method mm -hmm. and they assumed some transformed data following Gaussian distribution. Oh. So the motivation of my method, the one oh. I will introduce today, cluster DE, is motivated by the finding our obser observation that these solutions will not work when genes are correlated. Mm. And this is the result. So mm -hmm. from our simulation, if we simulate genes to be independent, mm -hmm. then both the double dipping naive method and cell split method would not work as expected. Mm -hmm. Gene split, can split seem to have quite uniform, close to uniform p-value distribution, mm -hmm. which are okay. Mm -hmm. But if we have half of the genes correlated, wow. then you see their p-value distributions are no longer uniform, but concentrated on zero, which means that we have this violation. What's the reason? Here is the intuition I'll give here. For gene split, so we can see that even though genes one is a non-DG and we have gene two as a non-DG, mm. but if they have correlations, there's a problem. Since mm. gene two is used in clustering, so mm. therefore gene two will be correlated, the gene mm. two expression will be correlated with the cluster label Z hat. Mm. And as gene two and gene one are correlated, so mm. then the Z hat label will be correlated with gene one, mm -hmm. and that will make gene one a uh, false positive. I That's see. the problem. So correlation will really do make the problem bad. Mm -hmm. How about count split? First, we confirm the theory in the paper. That is, if we have this gene one alone, right? We compare its count in the two split data. So mm -hmm. basically we look at gene one's counts in the two matrices. Yes, they are indeed uncorrelated. So mm -hmm. basically we confirm the result. But the problem is that if you have a gene two, which is also non-DE gene correlated with gene one, same as in the last problem, gene two will 
drive double dipping. So gene two will be make a false positive DE gene by double dipping. And gene two in the training data is still correlated with gene one, the test data. So mm. even though gene one itself has no correlation between training and test, but gene two train can be correlated with gene one test, which will make gene one test false positivity. Mm -hmm. So you see that the correlation is really making the thing problematic. So then what's our solution? All right, so I've laid down the existing work. Sorry, I think it's stuck again. So our method, we call it cluster DE. We try to implement something, in my opinion, more straightforward. Mm -hmm. By straightforward, what I mean is that we have been motivated. Let me try to go back one slide. We have been motivated by the use of negative control in the experiment. So we think that if that's the case, why not set up a negative control in our computational analysis? You know, in the real wet lab experiment, there are also many, many steps that's complicated, but a very complicated protocol. So people set up negative control to make sure that the observations in the end is really different from the negative control sample and it's something real. So as we see that double dipping is basically some artifacts generated by the computational pipeline. You do clustering and DE on the same data. Mm. Then why not we generate some synthetic null data from the real data? And here we refer to real data as target data. Then what if we have synthetic null data that mimic target data, but we know that it's a negative case? So in our case, saying that it's a negative case, it means there is only one cell type we believe to be. But we hope that the cells in the synthetic null data will mimic the real data cells as much as possible. So I will I'll explain in detail what we preserve. Mm -hmm. And given that, we hope that when we run the same analysis pipeline on both data sets, we can do a contrast in the end to remove false discoveries. Mm. So specifically, we will run the same clustering algorithm on both data sets. And then for each data set, we will do the DE test between two clusters. So every gene will have a DE score in each data set. So by DE score, we mean negative log P values. You can define in other ways, but in general, we just want the DE score to like a larger score to mean the gene is more likely DE. So then every gene will have two scores, one from target data, one from no data, and they serve as a contrast. So the last step is just to compare the two scores for each gene. And we will only call a gene as a reliable DE gene mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. its target score is much bigger than the null score. So mm -hmm. that means the gene is really like a DE gene. But mm -hmm. for the majority of genes, which are unlikely DE genes, we believe that the either score could be bigger. So therefore the contrast score, if we define as a difference, S1 minus S1 tilde as C1, S2 minus S2 tilde C2, then they should be symmetric about zero. Mm -hmm. So that's the last step for contrast. So for now, I will first introduce what we add to the beginning of the pipeline, the synthetic node generation. How do we generate synthetic node data? So as I said, so, and also thank you for acknowledging our work. Mm -hmm. So the motivation is for our, based on, or is enabled, I should say, enabled by our simulator development, SA Design 3, which is the recent work that can generate realistic synthetic data based on real data. But for this particular task, that is we want to generate one cell type, we were basically motivated by or I would say what we did is same as SA Design 2. So that is we generate data from a fitted multi-gene model. So in SA Design 2, which is a special case of SA Design 3, we have one distribution, one model for each cell type. We mm -hmm. model each gene as a variable or feature, mm -hmm. and we consider the cells as a random sample from that distribution. So there are two considerations in our modeling. 
First, we assume that for the cell type, right? Within the cell type, we assume a gene's UMI count. You know, UMI stands for unique molecular identifier, which has the PCR amplification bias removed. We expect, we know that the gene's UMI count should follow a negative binomial distribution in each cell type. And this has been supported by our own paper and mm -hmm. also other people's paper. Mm -hmm. That's the marginal distribution. But what's most critical is the joint distribution where gene-gene correlations we help to preserve instead of assuming genes to be independent. Because in the real data, we have seen that genes are not independent within the cell type. So we hope to fit a multivariate negative binomial distribution. So every gene is negative binomial, but we want their joint distribution. However, this distribution is not easy to fit. It has to be approximated. What we do as the approximation is to use the Gaussian copula. So what is it? What is it? Mm -hmm. Copula is a traditional statistical technique for multivariate statistics. It allows us to link or couple multiple random variables into a joint distribution as long as we know the marginal distribution of each random variable. So it's a very useful technique. Mm -hmm. In our case, we assume each gene J follows a negative binomial distribution. Then for the joint distribution, we assume that on the transformed scale, that is, we transform every gene J from the original count to some standard Gaussian random variable by monotone transformation. What we do exactly is that we first transform the gene just count to its CDF value, standing for cumulative distribution function value, using the negative binomial we fit it. Then we transform the CDF value back to standard Gaussian value using the inverse of the standard Gaussian CDF. So then we convert every gene to a standard Gaussian random variable. And then we link them into an n-dimensional distribution because we have n genes by fitting a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Then what's left for us to fit or estimate is this n by n correlation matrix in mm -hmm. the multivariate Gaussian. So Gaussian copula is just one of the possible copulas to help us fit a multivariate distribution. And there are some technical details involved. For example, we know that Gaussian distribution is continuous while negative binomial distribution is discrete. How can we convert a discrete random variable to a continuous random variable? We do, we use this random interpolation technique, just try to make the CDF function from like a step function into a smooth function. So just to satisfy this continuity for Gaussian. Okay, that's the technical detail in the essay design too. Basically, together, what we do is that we help to fit a null model, which is an M-dimensional Gaussian copula for one cell type to represent the negative control case where there's only one cell type. So what we do exactly is that for the real data, we first fit a negative binomial distribution for each gene. And we use this technical distributional transform to convert this negative binomial count distribution to make it continuous. Then we can transform each gene to standard Gaussian random variable, and then we fit a multivariate normal distribution by estimating the correlation matrix. With that, then we can sample, we can sample the negative control or synthetic null data. What we do is that we first sample from this multivariate Gaussian distribution, then we transform each gene from standard Gaussian random variable back to the negative binomial distribution. So we restore the counts. And this is the cartoon showing what I said, using two genes as example. Mm -hmm. So here we have real data as counts. We fit a marginal negative binomial distribution for each gene. Then we transform every gene's counts to CDF values. Then transform the CDF values to standard Gaussian random variable values. 
Then we fit a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Mm -hmm. And then we sample from this distribution as our synthetic cells. And then we transform every gene from Gaussian to CDF. Finally, we take the negative binomial CDF inverse to transform the values to count. So then we can restore the count level data. So there are two ways to make sure that the data look like one cell type. First, marginally every gene is negative binomial, right? So that's like what we observe for real data. Second, on the transform scale, the multivariate Gaussian distribution is known to be homogeneous. So that will give us a homogeneous cluster of cells mm -hmm. instead of having gaps in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is what we observe on real data. So when the data has like one cell type, mm -hmm. we can have the synthetic normal cells mimic real data pretty well. What we preserve essentially is that for every gene, we preserve the mean, we preserve the variance, and the mean and variance are both calculated across all cells, and we preserve gene-gene rank correlation. Mm -hmm. The reason is that we are doing this monotone transformation, right, to do Gaussian copula, so we preserve the rank correlation. And this is what happens if the real data has a gap in the middle. So here we actually have two cell types, and then the synthetic null data will fill in the gap to make a big cloud and showing that, okay, there should be only one type. But in, on the other hand, we still preserve the overall statistics, right? Second order statistics, which is the rank correlation and two first order statistics, mean and variance for every gene across all cells. So our hope is that if we apply a clustering algorithm, this will serve as a reasonable negative control as if the real cells are just of one type. So that's the synthetic null generation part. The second part is the end of the pipeline, contrast. What if we have the contrast scores for every gene, right? By comparing the target score, null score, we do a difference. What do we do? How can we use the contrast scores and we don't have p-values. How do we use contrast scores instead of p-values to control the FDR? So this will rely on a method we previously published called Clipper. So Clipper, this is the manuscript, and this is the cartoon showing how it works. The motivation was to see whether it's possible to do FDR control when it's not easy to get p-values. Sometimes, as I mentioned, for the bulk RNA-seq analysis, the parametric distribution, such as negative binomial, assumed in d 6 hr might not hold, then a p-values may not be valid. Sometimes you don't have a large sample size, so you can get a non-parametric p-value, such as Wilcoxon. So for those reasons, I think it would be desirable if we can start from a statistic directly for FDR control instead of worrying about how to get valid p-values. And luckily, in the statistic literature, there's a line of research called knockoffs that provides a theorem for us to use here. So we adopt the theorem to find a way to set up a contrast score threshold. So what we need is just a contrast score for each feature. So here the notation is changed to D for D features instead of M because this is from the Clipper paper. But what we mean is that if you have one contrast score per feature, you pull them together, you get this distribution, a histogram for the D contrast scores. The question is, if I want to set an FDR threshold 5%, where is the cutoff? Where do I set the cutoff? So the theory from Nakoff says that, oh, the, the, the cutoff should be set in a way that you maximize your discoveries by pushing this T to be as small as possible because this right tail will be your discoveries. But how do you find T? You calculate this ratio, which is number of features below negative T, the red tail plus one over the blue tail, which mm -hmm. is the denominator. So you can roughly think this as an estimate of FDR. Mm -hmm. The assumption we need here is that mm -hmm. for the null features where the null hypothesis hold, their contrast scores should be symmetric about zero. With this symmetry, 
then the red tail basically um, roughly represents the number of false discoveries in the blue tail. Mm -hmm. That's why red over blue is like an FDR estimate. And you want to push this T to be as small as possible as long as you satisfy this ratio under Q. That's the intuition. And basically for this type of FDR control approach, the symmetry of contrast scores replaces the uniform condition for p-values. So we require symmetry here. And we think this opens the door for doing this synthetic null control, because as long as we have a good negative control, we can apply the same pipeline to the real data and to the synthetic null data in parallel, we just compare the end results to construct a contrast score. This is flexible and easy to adopt. And for users, we can check the symmetry to make sure that the synthetic null data is a reasonable null data so that this approach works. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, cluster DE is an ensemble of our previous method development. We used SAD line three to construct the synthetic null data. So in the middle, the clustering is performed on both the target data and null data separately to get the cluster labels. Then we, on each data set, we calculate the DE scores by doing DE tests on each cluster, on each data set based on the clusters. Then every gene J will have two DE scores. Then we construct the contrast score by difference. Mm -hmm. Then we set the contrast score cutoff by clipper. Mm -hmm. Finally, we find the genes as D genes if their contrast scores are greater than a cutoff. That's the whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then in the following, I will quickly go over, I think, the, the theory, right? The theory, how we can actually ensure this to work. So the symmetry is the most important assumption. The, the contrast score must be symmetric, otherwise it will not work. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that we can allow the features to be sort of dependent. So this is like a weak dependency condition. We don't require the features to be independent. Otherwise, there would be, you know, this it's not realistic. Even though for the theory to hold, ideally we want dependency, but we want independency. But weak dependency is fortunately allowed if we just want to control the FDR asymptotically. And here the asymptotic asymptotacy is based on number of features. So this is actually adopted from an existing statistics paper about FDR control. And this condition says that as long as for the null contrast scores, mm -hmm. if we convert them into indicators and we take the sum, we take the variance of the sum. So if they're all independent, this variance should scale with the number of null features, which is M0. It should be M0 power one. If they are perfectly dependent, like identical, M0 will have power two. Mm -hmm. But what we require here is that as long as it's not power two, you are you, you scale slower than that, then it's called weak dependency. So mm -hmm. this is a technical condition, but it can lead to this asymptotic FDR control. And the result is adopted from this statistics paper in 2023. Mm -hmm. So what we try to say here is that this is the ideal FDP, which we don't observe. So I should say FDP is the ratio inside FDR. And it, it, so FDR is the expectation of FDP is proportion, false discovery proportion. It's actually among our discoveries, what's the proportion as false discovery? But we don't observe this. What we use in the clipper procedure is FDP hat, where the numerator is the left tail instead of the false discoveries in the right tail. So we change the numerator. And this tau Q is the clipper cutoff. So we try to find the T to satisfy this FDP hat is under Q. And that's the cutoff. So then the theory says that at this cutoff, with the, these assumptions hold, then the FDP, actual FDP at this cutoff is not much bigger than the target Q. So the difference is kind of diminishing. It's going down to zero as feature number goes large. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, 
we can have the asymptotic control on the FDR at this time. So that's why we will say this procedure has the theoretical guarantee if we have the symmetry assumption. Mm -hmm. So I'll quickly show some results mm -hmm. about how this method works. Mm -hmm. So the first result is mm -hmm. based on real data where mm -hmm. we have five cell lines. So we know that each cell line is only one cell type. So there shouldn't be more than one cell types found by clustering. So this is how the synthetic node data look like for these cases. And we see that cluster DE found zero D genes as expected for most cases. So we use the popular SURAT pipeline for single cell data analysis. And there are, we consider five DE tests, the statistical tests in SURAT, including Wilcoxon, two sample T tests, etc. So we see for many combinations of statistical tests and the five cell lines, we have zero discovery. And we focus on Wilcoxon because it has the very consistent performance. But you see, naive double dipping in SURAT, the count split method, the one that split the matrix into two matrices, and the TN test, which is the sales split method published in 2019, they still find thousands of DE genes from this data set. So not so much fewer than the naive double dipping method. So this shows that we can control the false discoveries when there's only one cell type. And if the real data has two cell subtypes, so I'm quickly... Mm -hmm here. So, yeah, this one. So when the real data has two cell subtypes, then we can have some discoveries, even though the numbers are much fewer than the naive double dipping or count split. And again, these are four different samples, mm -hmm. I mean, done by different single cell technologies or different replicates with the same blood sample. So we focus on these two subtypes. So we'll show that the genes we found here are biologically more meaningful as cell type markers. So first of all, we are showing here, so, so these two sets are known genes, the monocyte markers and housekeeping genes. So we see that for these two sets of genes, if we just use target D score, which is from Surat, subject to double dipping, then we can have some housekeeping genes with very large D scores, like 30 means the P value is 10 to the negative 30, very small P value. And there's some overlap between the two sets. But once we add our synthetic null as the control, you see the housekeeping genes also have pretty big null D scores. Then once we do a contrast, target minus null in the Y axis, then you see the two sets are better separated. So we have better separation of two sets than just using the target D scores. And this is confirmed by gene set enrichment analysis, in hmm. which we look at each set of genes and we see where the set is enriched in the ranked D list by our method and naive method. So you see that the markers are enriched more in the top while housekeeping genes are more enriched in the middle to bottom in our result, while in the SURAT results, they are not so distinguishable. And a second application where we applied cluster DE to this Drosophila visual system developmental atlas data set in this nature paper. And we found that the authors annotated more than 400 clusters. But for some clusters, the authors give them the same cell type label, meaning that biologically they couldn't be distinguished. And we confirm that applying cluster D to these two cells, cell clusters in one pair, like the three pairs here, we find zero D genes. But if you use Surat, you can find thousands of D genes. So that's, again, an example showing that using our cluster D mm -hmm. on two cell clusters, which are ambiguous, mm -hmm. and if you are unsure whether they should be merged, then you can use cluster D to help you identify D genes for confirmation. 
And finally, this is a recent development in which we apply cluster DE to spatial transcriptomics data. We still implement the synthetic neural data idea. For example, if you use spatial clustering algorithms to find spatial domains, and you want to decide whether the domains should be merged or stay mm -hmm. as separate, then we can generate synthetic neural data in which the domain boundary is smooth. There's no sharp changes in the boundary as a negative control. And then you can see that using this approach, the genes we identify as top D genes are more visible or better markers of the spatial domain than the one you get from SURAT. So that's the spatial application. So finally, I will say that we think double dipping is is basically very common in single cell and spatial data analysis. And this cluster D is a general framework. We want to advocate the use of synthetic null data to as a negative control, which is very transparent and users can see. And we use this contrast approach clipper for FDR control. And since we only generate synthetic null data for once, we can save the computational resource. You don't have to do that many, many times to get p-values. And finally, my message is that I think many bioinformatics algorithms have mm -hmm. are black boxes or multi-step. And if we want to make sure our results are more transparent, more reliable, we hope that synthetic data can be helpful. Mm -hmm. So finally, I want to thank my very talented student, Dong Yuan, for wow. leading the effort for both SX3 and Cluster DE. Um, my other student, Christy, for her contribution to Cluster DE application, and the visiting student, Sichi, for, for contributing the spatial part, and my former student, Xin Zhou, who is currently a, an assistant professor himself at Oregon State University and the funding agencies for the support. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Wow, thanks so much. Okay, let me scar 